Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It's no longer hurricane season, but I do produce these videos at least once a week during the off-season. For the most part, the entire six months. Sometimes when the weather is just simply boring or maybe there's a holiday period, like what's coming up with Christmas, I may take the week off. But usually try to get together once a week to discuss the upcoming hurricane season. We're always uh, at least six months or less away from the next hurricane season uh, once things are over at the end of November and the clock starts ticking and people want to know what might happen next year. And there are some fairly large puzzle pieces that we can look at that can at least perhaps be a guide as to what to look for. No clear answers this far out. Many people have tried and many people have failed to predict the hurricane season coming up in December with any degree of accuracy. So what I like to do, instead of trying to get numbers this far out, saying there's going to be X numbers of named storms or how many hurricanes, whatever, more like to look at the bigger climate pieces that are going to be in play, sea surface temperatures, El Nino or not, things like that. So let's start off with one of the most important parameters uh, at least one of the signals that I like to track, not only in what may affect next year's hurricane season, but even lower 48 weather, because the other part of this off-season update has to do with tracking winter storms and then in the springtime potential severe weather outbreaks, some of which we could even deploy some of our equipment for testing and public awareness and live video events. Uh, even when there are not hurricanes. We did a lot of that this past season. No hurricanes hit the United States, yet we streamed more live video of other events, winter storms in January, February of this year, and then several flooding events in South Carolina, some high tide beach erosion in North Carolina, and then a couple of different flood events in the Houston, Texas area, as well as down on Galveston Island. Bolivar Peninsula, just to give you an idea. Yeah, we did a lot of work, even though there were no hurricanes, and that'll really pay off when there are. So, to the subject at hand, the Southern Oscillation Index, basically this is a way for us to see uh, via numbers what the pressure pattern is across the tropical Pacific. And the easiest way to understand this, this simplified version, the more negative these numbers are, like what we see here, especially September and October, then the more El Nino type pattern the atmosphere and the ocean are coupled together in. And when these numbers are closer to zero or neutral, then you have a more neutral pattern. It's neither warmer than normal nor colder than normal. And then you can see where I'm going with this. Once we get to positive territory, that's more typical of La Nina conditions where the trade winds are stronger than average or normal. Uh, I use those words interchangeably around here. And we can track this using the Bureau of Meteorology out of the Queensland government site to track the Southern Oscillation Index. And right now, uh, each day it's compiled, taking measurements from Tahiti and Darwin, and you get an equation involved, and boom, you get a number. And that's what I like, the final result. And so what is that? Well, today it's a negative 1277. And the last 30 days, it's negative 734, which is uh, pretty high uh, compared to September, October, a little bit higher than November. In November, we had a very strong positive stretch in the SOI numbers. So we came close to, uh, much closer to neutral than we've seen in a long time. And I believe that that is the first shot across the bow, if you will, of the end of the El Nino. Uh, it'll peak if it hasn't already done so, and it might have, and then it's going to really decline quickly once we get into 2016. So this is what it looks like now. The result of those very strong negative numbers for most of the summer and fall has resulted in a substantial warming of the tropical Pacific here from uh, the coast of South America off of Colombia, past the Galapagos Islands and all the way out, pretty close to the dateline uh, in the tropical Pacific. My iPhone's talking to me, but it'll have to wait. 
Um, and that anomaly is the El Nino. The trade winds slackened. They even reversed in some cases where the westerly winds uh, came in and uh, pushed the very warm water of the tropical West Pacific uh, towards this region. You had very warm subsurface water and it all came together for what is a record-breaking El Nino event. At the same time, the Atlantic uh, warmed pretty significantly in this region during uh, the 2015 hurricane season. It's cooled off a little bit as of late, probably some stronger trades blowing through here. But notice the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean for the most part, and especially the Western Atlantic, still averaging quite a bit above normal on the skin of the ocean, sea surface temperatures along the skin of the ocean. So this will be one thing that we watch coupled with this right here. And what I'm going to be watching for is to see obviously the daily numbers come up and then these averages over here start to come up. And so by the time we get into spring next year we should be back in positive territory overall and you'll start to see this begin to change. But more importantly I think than this, or at least as equally important we can say, is this. A remarkable tool, a cross-section of the anomalies in the Pacific Ocean. Um, think of it like a CAT scan even though it's not the same technology. It's literally a slice of the Pacific and it shows us the temperature profile. Here is the El Nino obviously uh, dominating the picture, literally. You know, very warm anomalies here. Uh, just unbelievable positive anomalies in the eastern Pacific but this has been basically shrinking and kind of being cornered over here literally into the eastern Pacific while this very large and more prominent blob of cold water begins to develop. This subsurface cold pool, uh, some of these cold anomalies here reaching four degrees Celsius below average and some of these anomalies are not too far from the surface and you can see this white area is neutral there is no anomaly it's right there in the middle and uh, so here's El Nino dominating the eh, good two-thirds of the tropical Pacific but this it will eventually go away we don't have another large warm blob coming in from the west over here that's going to be pushed over to reinforce this and it's just a matter of time this will go away and probably be replaced by a fairly substantial La Nina over the next couple of years at least there won't be an El Nino. I believe that that is almost a given based on what I see uh, with the pattern evolving plus the models are picking up on it. This is another tool that we will be tracking at least once a month sometimes twice a month and uh, this shows us the different uh, International Research Institute Climate Prediction Center uh, plume based ENSO forecast fancy way of saying What's the El Nino going to do? Well, over the next several months, 100% uh, chance of El Nino, and then it really drops off quickly. And then look at this. This is very important. The models beginning to sense a slightly better than 50-50 chance right here by the time we get to June, July, August time frame of neutral conditions setting in. And then La Nina starts to creep in almost to 30% by the time we get to July, August, September with the El Nino being way down here at just a little over 20 percent. So this is substantial because this already in the scheme of things this is the heart of next year's hurricane season. Isn't that amazing we can see out that far. It's very fuzzy even though it's clear on the graph. A word of caution these can be drastically wrong. I will say that. This is just what the models are sensing now. This is a uh, graphical uh, bar graph representation. This is a nice plot of the same uh, data, uh, just another way of looking at it. And this is really neat to see, I think. You can really see the decline overall. And that's what I want to see. What's the pattern? What's the trend? Um, is it you know, unanimous that everything's falling? Yes, it is. Uh, what we don't see are models going like this and then some of them like that. Uh, divergence for the most part. We don't see any divergence in the models. Uh, everything is aimed downward as you can clearly see over the next several months towards that neutral line and maybe even into La Nina territory. Thus, I would expect that next year's hurricane season 
would produce more activity than what we saw this hurricane season, provided that this region does not cool substantially uh, and this region up here does not warm substantially, or even down here, uh, where you have warm water as a uh, over the uh, compared to normal over colder water compared to normal, sort of a flip of what you would expect to see. If that doesn't happen, boy, somebody's blowing up my phone, as they say. If that doesn't happen, then I think next year's hurricane season could be quite busy. And that's what we will talk about over the next several months. All right, so that's it for the tropics. Let's look at lower 48 weather. Pretty much anywhere east of the Rockies right now, except for the extreme eastern part of Massachusetts and coastal waters therein. No problems whatsoever with any type of major weather concerns, although the warm air mass, moist air mass, and then the, uh, well, really mainly the moisture in the atmosphere, and then the cool nights that we're having, fog is going to be an issue in a good deal of the southeast. And so be uh, uh, aware of that. You know, that is a weather phenomenon uh, that can cause problems, even though it doesn't necessarily show up. They don't have fog watches and fog warnings. They'll issue an advisory when it happens, but, you know, a dense fog advisory, but there's no outlook for it, so to speak. So I'm telling you, uh, all these areas in here and then maybe even outside of it, but especially the southeast, foggy nights coming up and foggy mornings for the commute as well. The real action is over here in the Pacific Northwest as a string of storms comes in one after the other uh, over the next several days. Very, very high precipitable water values, incredible amounts of snow in the Cascades, working their way down <clears throat> into parts of the Sierra Nevada. So great news for the snowpack. Uh, not so great for people traveling and trying to exist amongst this, amongst this rather inclement weather that's coming, but with the drought situation out west as severe as it has been talked about, this is a welcome sight for sure. Here's what it looks like on the GFS. This is North America. Just outline it for you real quick. The Cape Cod area, Cape Hatteras, Florida, and then down towards Mexico, the Baja, et cetera, et cetera. Um, eventually, I'll finish my broadcast here and see who's blowing up my phone. For now, I will try to ignore it. So this is 24 hours from today. Uh, basically, this is valid uh, Wednesday morning. And you can see up here in the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia, west coast of Canada there, pretty active pattern as the little storm system, uh, almost like a little nor'easter with a front associated with it, pushes off away from New England. 48 hours out, Thursday morning, heavy rain, mountain snow, you name it, coming in, strong low pressure coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. 72 hours, Friday morning, uh, roughly 7 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, stormy pattern as system after system is lined up to come into the Pacific Northwest. Notice the uh, isotherm here. This is the 10 degree uh, isotherm. What's that mean? Well, that's a line of equal temperature, and that's 10 degrees Celsius. So it's around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Mild evenings with lots of moisture is going to mean a lot of fog night after night and morning after morning in parts of the southeast. Remember, that's going to be a big issue. Day four, this would be valid on Saturday morning. Another storm system coming into the Pacific Northwest here. High pressure setting up over the surface and above and aloft off the southeast coast like a summer pattern in December. At day five, uh, the storm system uh, gets ejected out into the Great Plains. Possibility of severe weather in parts of the deep south as we get into later stages of the weekend ahead. Classic setup, Bermuda High sitting out here. Strong southerly flow ahead of the cold front coming in, and cool dry air coming in behind it. Some severe weather possible along the battlefront, if you will, up the Mississippi Valley. So pay attention to that uh, if you're anywhere. Well, you'll, you'll see it on the weather.gov and the SPC. And for people that follow this kind of thing, you'll be probably pretty aware of it anyway. But I just wanted to give you a heads up. Day six, the front moves farther to the east. Uh, starts to wash out. No real cold intrusions yet. There's the Bermuda High, literally. I mean, there's Bermuda anchored sitting over the western and central Atlantic. Southerly flow around the backside, meaning mild in the east. Cold and stormy out west, especially the Pacific Northwest. So that by the time we get out to a week uh, into time, wow, you know, just no real major blast of cold, especially in the east. 
Most of it's locked up out west over the Rockies and parts of the Cascades and Sierra. And then really, looking a week out, there are no major storm systems on the map. That can change, but it's just not the kind of pattern that's promoting excessive storminess for a wide swath of the country, even though the Pacific Northwest will be hammered, and there certainly is a population concern out there. You know, people live there. Um, we're not talking about massive disruptive snowstorms like we had last year. Not yet. The pattern's just not there yet. It'll probably come in January and February. We're not going to get out of the winter uh, escaping no major winter storms. I can almost guarantee you that. It's just that the next week, at least, it looks fairly tranquil, except for the Pacific Northwest and vicinity. All right, well, that's it. That's what we do here on the off-season off edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Again, I'll do this at least once a week. I'll try to do it on Mondays, but certainly Monday or Tuesday of each week. I'll publish it, and uh, you can view it and hopefully learn something and be aware of what's coming up in the tropics that we look for for the next hurricane season and, of course, what's going on with lower 48 weather as we wait for the next big winter storm and in the spring, severe weather outbreaks. All right? Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Again, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll talk to you again next week.